Welcome to the Teacher's Pep Rally. If you missed our last episode with Patsy Rausch about ways to create an environment of engagement and creativity, please go back and check it out. Our guest today is a college professor of computer science, among many things, other things, has two podcasts, Geek Author and Nurturing the Knack, a YouTube channel, Intermation. He's an author and creative writer. Check out his book, Computer Organization and Design Fundamentals. He teaches hard concepts in a way that can make just about anyone understand it. Please welcome to the Teacher's Pep Rally, my friend, Dave Tarnoff. Uh, you know, I want to thank you all so, so much for, but I've been listening to your podcast since it started. Um, and you have filled a gap that I didn't know was there. You know, all of my, all of my buddies, you know, we'll all go out to, to lunch every day, you know, middle of the day, it's a good way to get a break. And they're kind of my teacher support group, you know, hi, my name is Dave and I'm a teacher. Um, <laughs> and you all have filled that gap to a degree. So thank you. And wow. thank you so oh, much. So thank you so much for, for inviting me. I, you also, you, you, you made me realize what a control freak I am because with all of those things that I do, you understand I'm a writer because I can edit. Um, you know, I can <sighs> do scripts. I can, I can do retakes and things like that when it comes to being in front of the camera. You all have taken away my net and I'm not very happy about that. <laughs> we'll take good care of you. I promise. I promise. You're in good company, Dave. So Letitia, I didn't tell you that we will be uh, learning about the fundamentals of computers today. Are you ready? The video, the shortest, one of the shortest videos, but I watched and I was impressed with the glowy markers and the board. So I'm ready to learn tonight. I am so glad you brought that up. So full disclosure, he may not want me to admit this, but Dave's a good friend of mine. Um, we meet on a weekly basis. We don't live in the same state, so we, we meet on Zoom. We we were doing that before the pandemic, weren't we, Dave? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And since, so and I looked at the I, I looked at the uh, the calendar. It's been since 2018. So it's wow. been a while. Wow. Nice. Nice. It's a, and it's very cool because we, I mean, I really do consider Dave one of my good friends and it's, and we, for the, we've seen each other twice face to face, like in person, that's it. in all that time. And so you yeah. really can build relationships <laughs> through these little squares. I may not recommend it, but it, but it yeah. does, it does work. Um, and the reason why I wanted Dave to come on, well, there's a couple of reasons, but the one thing is my Dave, do you mind telling us how long you've been an educator? <laughs> um, I, I have been sitting on the dark side of the desk since 1994. Mm, the dark side. Yeah. Yeah. Star Wars always makes its way into these episodes. Wait, always. It's like, I love it. I love it. It's a dark and, side of the moon. And so when the pandemic happened and we were kind of, uh, looking at what your, you know, next year or semester was going to look like. I watched you pivot in a way I've never seen someone pivot before. You, you <laughs> took, you're talking about removing the net. You took what you've always done and you completely changed the way that you are teaching your students. And so that's a little bit what Letitia's kind of mentioning here is about that board. Can you give us a little bit of a story about that journey? Yeah. Who's the explorer who burned the ships? Um, Cortez. Cortez. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it was, it was one of those, it was, it was almost one of those things. Um, how far back do you want me to go? Well, let's talk about when you realize that you may not be teaching face-to-face -face in the classroom yeah, or um, have a choice to pick maybe. Um, and, and I have heard the, the word Disney mentioned on this uh, podcast before. Um, we were packing in March to uh, go for spring break to, to Disney. And the rental car was in our, the, the rental van was in our driveway. We were packed and we were ready to go when we got an email from the university saying um, everything's going online right after spring break. And uh, at that time, then Disney, you know, about six hours later, Disney closed. 
And so, and, and actually, thank goodness, because I'm such a, a fan that I, I don't know that going online for my classes would have stopped me from going down to Disney. And then I would have really been in a pickle whenever I got back. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the university has a, has this, this online meeting software and stuff. And, and so, and, the, and they were telling us things like, you know, you, you know, we don't know in terms of each student, whether because of medical or family or financial issues, if they'll be able to sit into a, you know, the synchronous online classes. And so you, you, we really need you to record the classes and so forth. So I was just trying the, my best to do it with what tools I had sitting in front of me um, in order to do this kind of synchronous thing. And since the students knew it was being recorded, guess what? They mm -hmm. slowly stopped coming. <laughs> um, and I think at the end of the semester, I had two students that were live. Mm. And well, they may have been, I don't know, their cameras were <laughs> off, who knows. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and so whenever the, uh, whenever my department chair came up to me in Jul June or July and said, um, you, you know, we're probably going to have the same deal in the fall. Um, but, uh, you know, how would you like to handle this? And in a split second decision, I, I took away the net. I burned the ships. I said, uh, I'm going asynchronous online. And it's, and, and I started just studying how could I do, you know, I wanted to have a face-to-face -face presence. I wanted to be facing my students. I want to be looking at my students. I am brokenhearted by not having them face me, face back to me because I love the interaction in the classroom. I, you know, I love my students. They are just, they give me energy. Um, mm. You know, you all probably, you know, all of us being teachers know that feeling when you feel sick, like your stomach or something or, or something, you, you've got a cold and you're thinking about, yeah, I've got to go to this class. But when you walk into that classroom, something happens magical. Yeah. I don't know what it's called, but something in that hour and a half mm. or however long you're in front of your students, you're not sick. And then the class is over and you tank. Yeah. And, yeah. That's and, so true. And yes. so I, I don't, I don't know how that happens. I don't know what it happens, but there's an energy that you get from your students. There's an energy you get from the interaction. There's an energy you get from just, you know, knowing you're a part of that experience. And so I have lost that, but I wanted to make sure that my students got that, that, that facial, that me, that presence of me in the classroom and so I started out, I found a spare piece of plexiglass in the basement and I built a wooden frame around it and put some strip LEDs that I'd gotten from Walmart around the perimeter. And it was great, except it was only about two feet by two feet. And it was just way too small. <laughs> and, and so, and that was what I did. I, I ordered some, some fluorescent markers and just took an old camera that I had and pointed it, actually a webcam, I guess, pointed it at that board and tried to do things. And the effect was so cool that I thought this is this, I've got to do this, but two by two is not big enough. Now understand it was summertime when I was doing this. And so we didn't need the storm door glass for our front door. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it's, it's been pretty cold this winter and we still have a screen in that door. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. My, the dogs love it, but my family's not too pleased. Um, and so I put, I built this frame and out of uh, iron pipe, you know, the type that iron pipe that you screw the pieces together and you have the corners and so forth. I made a frame and took some uh, of those tie down straps and strapped that uh, piece of storm door glass to the, to the frame. And it's, it's I'm in my basement. Um, and when I have, I'm able to park a, a couple of cars in the basement down here. And one of my cars is a, an old convertible Mustang. And I had to set the tripod up in the back seat of the Mustang. This is how DIY it is <laughs> so that I could get the picture and everything. Right. I have fooled around with lighting. I've got started out with trouble lights and halogen lights and and have moved up to to different lighting effects and and really it's just kind of grown from there um and one more thing and i'll stop talking um the uh, the the university had this video um uh, service and i was not getting really reliable service from it so i just went ahead and just started youtube 
And so I created a channel and just started uploading the videos. And, you know, a huge blessing from this has been, I've got students now from all over the world that are emailing yeah. me saying things like, you actually made this make sense. Oh, that's and cool. I am so grateful for, for their, their very kind words. Um, it's been encouraging and making me kind of carry on. So there you go. Nice. <laughs> nice. I just love the plexiglass. And fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it, Fred, I've got the plexiglass. It's still sitting up over here. If you that's know fantastic. It. I, you know, and, and I, 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 you know, Dave and I know each other also. And, um, I, I said this even what a couple of weeks ago to Aaron, I believe I'm like, that is a product because, you know, we've all been, we've all been around our positions long enough. And I'm sure you have been too, Dave, right? Where we've had to maybe evaluate a technology that's going to be purchased yeah. or, and we've got okay. to the whole, the whole vendor thing, you know, and, yeah, and it starts off cool. like, yeah. And then they bring, I remember a similar board, they brought it in. It was going to be expensive and it was going to be complicated. And then when I, when I, I think about what the goal is, but then I think about what you built and the, DIY factor and cost. I think it's absolutely brilliant. So if anybody's listening, well, those who are listening to this, go out to your channel. And so they could see this, um, <laughs> see this and get this on there because it's a fantastic idea. You got to hope you have to see it. I think it's, I think it's a doable thing and it's something that schools could adopt and have big wins. Even if, even in the live setting, I, I love the idea that you're not turning your back to the students yeah. and <laughs> you're, you're looking at them through the plexiglass and you're right. And now, I guess the reverse thing is the only factor. How did you get over yeah. that? Um, I, you know, I learned how to draw it right backwards. Nice. <laughs> no, uh, you know, what? No, I thought this surprised me though. So it's like <laughs> the the video editing software, you just mirror it. Um, yeah. it. It's it's really quick and easy to mirror that. Um, and except that the that in in electrical engineering, there's this thing called the right hand rule. And um, it's this deal where you can you, you generate magnetic fields. If you've ever done the old trick whenever you were little and you wrapped a, a wire around a nail and then connected it to a dry cell battery in order to make an electromagnet, magnet, everybody except Letitia is nodding. Um, <laughs> she's, she's the only normal one. Um, <laughs> like, uh, and, um, is more scarce. <laughs> Um, that the, the principle that creates that magnetic field in the nail is called the right hand rule. Well, I knew that I was going to be doing this mirrored. So I did it with the left hand instead thinking right hand. Okay. And then I thought, okay, the, the, the wire is going to be going the wrong way around the nail that I'm drawing on the board. Well, it turns out that whenever you mirrored it, but since you're looking at it from it, from the back side, the wire around the nail was just fine. It was my hand that was wrong. And so <laughs> I, I have, I have the whole, you know, I have, I, I put these little notations in the video saying, please excuse me. I know. And, and, and so forth. So it's the video editing software has been a godsend because I've been able to just simply write a little note saying, yes, I know I messed up. <laughs> That's awesome. That is awesome. Wow. <laughs> I have so many thoughts in my head right now. So, you know, now that I know the behind the scenes, I appreciate this eight minute video that I watched <laughs> today, just greater appreciation. But what makes me warm and fuzzy, Dave, is even though I know nothing about computer science, the fact that you were talking and drawing at the same time, you were calm in the midst of my anxiety, not knowing anything about computer science. I just felt like you were really connecting with me, someone that knows nothing about it. So that's what I truly appreciate about, about appreciate about at least the eight minute video and your sense of humor is great too. So thank you, you know. so much. That's so sweet of you to say. I mean, and it, it really so does awesome. feel like he's there with you, doesn't it, Letitia? Exactly. It they're, was, they're, they're excellent. And I was thinking about how is he able to write? <laughs> I was so impressed by that. I was like, this guy's a genius. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I pulled back the curtain. Yeah, it's it's just technology. That's what we do here. <laughs> That's what we do here. You know, I, I saw a, something the other day and it was a, um, a door decorated on a, a classroom entering the classroom and it said, teach like a pineapple. Now, I have no idea what they meant by that. But I'm going to make up my own 
assumption. And that is, I know a pineapple is symbolic for welcome. And right. so my assumption is teach, teach in a, in a welcoming way. And to me, the minute I saw that, I was like, that's Dave. I just, it doesn't matter what the subject is. And for right. me, it is, it is a little bit over my head. But when I listen to his podcast or watch his videos, I really can comprehend, Dave, what you're what you're saying. There's just something about the way you connect these kind of higher concepts or these higher ideas in math. How do you go about that? How do you seek trying to write these lessons that you can tap into all of your students, no matter what lo- learning level they are in? Well, remember, I've been doing this a while. Um, you know, the very first time you're thrown into a classroom, I don't know about you all, but I was scared stiff. Um, I was terrified and it showed. Um, and, and now, um, now I just, you know, scoop up my pens and head off to class. It's, it's, it's a lot more, you know, the, 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 you you get used to it. You really do. Um, you know, I appreciate all the kind words everybody's been saying. The one thing that it brings me, you know, you're talking about bringing it down to the, to the students level. Um, I, I had a, a significant shift in my uh, department. I went from the electrical engineering to the computer science department in the, oh. uh, in 2000. And well, you know, computer scientists don't tell Fred this, but Computer scientists forget that you can run hardware without software, but you can't run software without hardware. You got to have the hardware. And so the students, have to, <laughs> <laughs> the students have to understand the hardware. And what I, I was brought into the computer science department because the students needed to know the hardware stuff. And they had back in 2000, it was a $124 textbook that they were throwing at these students. And it was a lot of theory and it was very heavy into electrical engineering and so forth. And this was the, this was the introduction to hardware course that the students were getting. And I'd look out on that sea of faces, you know, as you're, as you're lecturing and the, the, the students are, you're trying to interact with them and you realize they have no clue what you're talking about. And so in 2000, I, I started making web pages. Um, so I get, gosh, that was 21 years ago. Yeah. Um, and so I started creating these web pages to support what was in the textbook. And so I would, you know, teach and then support what was in the textbook with my web pages and so forth. And around 2003 or so, I realized that the students had stopped buying that $124 textbook and were just going purely off the web page. And it was then that I thought, oh, well, wow, I maybe I had to, and, and what I did was I took all of those web pages and I just cleaned them up and formatted them. And that was the textbook that you were talking about, Aaron, at the beginning, was that, that, that book on computer organization and design fundamentals. And when I was able to, and I did this, the, the self-publishing route or actually publish on demand. And so I, you know, I had a couple of people review the book and so forth, but it's published on demand. So instead of $124, they're now paying $17. Oh, that's and, nice. and I was giving them if they didn't want, cause this is back in the days when we used this thing called paper. Um, <laughs> you know, they don't read off of paper anymore. Um, but that was back then they needed the comfort of the paper or maybe they did some didn't but if you wanted to do it electronically i just gave them the pdf for free the pdf is, is for free but now i realize that okay i have saved them over a hundred dollars maybe i can take a little of that money and have them have a piece of, of equipment that they can use and learn from and that was when I started doing things like these single board computers, these little mini computers, like, yep. well, the raw one we got now is the Raspberry Pi, right? Right, right. And so they can now take a Raspberry Pi home for about $45, you know, total and practice the things that we have been learning from the theory. Hmm. And so it just, it's kind of this, this thing. And, and you know, I, I, the, the school that I go to has a significant population of first generation college students. Um, and so a lot of them didn't have the financial resources in order to buy a textbook. A lot of them didn't even know what it was like to sit in a college classroom. Um, they didn't have that experience from their families. And so trying to kind of wrap your mind around these things that are challenges, guess what, you know, 
they've come up with some really cool things. COVID is a challenge. It really is a challenge. But look at what cool things that all of us have been able to do because mm -hmm. we've been asked to do it because it's hard, you know, because we're challenged. Yeah, I love I love the fact that you took on the the cost of the textbook because that is a real issue. And then I'm hoping that people listening to this understand that because I think some students still head into higher ed. Um, and this is going to sound odd, but, you, but we know we have students who come into higher ed and they can't buy the books. And then they're looking at us saying, what do I do now? Not understanding that that's part of the cost of, of going to college. Um, and, 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 and those textbooks do cost. So we did a, I shouldn't say we, but there's a study that was done on the freshman 10 classes. The cost of the books was $6 million. Yeah. And, and th that cost is crazy. So I know that there's a lot of schools that are taking a look at how could we defray those costs and how could we find grant money to defray those costs and, and do that. And, but I think what you did, Dave, is just so such a, 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 an ex excellent example to set, right? Because we know, we know what we can cover in the class, but to create those packages sometimes takes some work. And, and that's where, you know, we time. see that. Yeah. And, and so like we, we, every, you know, we lean on the textbook, we let it walk us through. It's the, it's the march to the sea. So what you did is fantastic. I'm, so I would not ask you then is, have you been able to kind of carry that through to other classes or you, do you still find certain classes that are challenging? Like from, for you to be able to take a book, boil it down. Is there other things like that? Do you think you can continue doing it? Yeah. Um, Letitia, I'm sorry, really sorry about this. Um, there's there's a, a course that I teach called computer architecture, uh, and it's it's talking about the advanced performance uh, features of processors. Digs really deep into how to make how to eke that next little bit of speed out of a processor, and some of those concepts are incredibly difficult. And so yes, I, I you know I've written a lot of stuff for all of my classes, but that class in particular. Because I'll be watching, you know, I'll be watching the news and they'll have some tech segment and they'll talk about this brand new technology and I'll realize they just wiped out a, a week of my classes. Um, and then I have to rewrite all of that. So some <laughs> of the classes. Yeah, and, it's fun, and, isn't it? Yeah. And, and it kind of, you know, I, 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 yeah, I, it, it changes. It's, it's a moving target. Yeah. And uh, so some of the classes, that class in particular has always been difficult to, to, keep creating up-to-date content but you're doing such a huge service so that you know that and that's it's big it's big first generation college right i mean that's it, part of the you know that's that market they have to understand yeah wow yeah yeah i never thought of that when you're teaching at that higher level and you're on the cutting edge of a subject it, it i never thought of that till now how it is quite the moving target so even more respect to you guys for navigating that and staying on top of things. That's, that's a lot. I keep telling my students I would teach math if paid better, but. <laughs> or, or history. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sitting here thinking about, I, I know, because I know a little bit about this, Dave, with your nurturing the knack, you know, you and I have talked a little bit about, um, what gender you specifically tend to see in your classrooms or in a oh, science yes. classroom. Yeah. Yep. Right. And so how would you, um, or give us some tips either for the parents that are listening or for other teachers or in for us, like how can we encourage the girls to pursue more in the science field? How do, how do we get that to happen? Well, um, there's, there's, there's two things that, that come to mind. The first thing is, is uh, my school has a, uh, a number of these summer, you know, middle school summer camps. Uh, I, I know schools all over the place, all over the country have it. Um, we have one that we have been doing since 2002 or 2003, pretty, or pretty early on, uh, that's called GIST, uh, Girls in Science and Technology. And I've been blessed to be invited as a, uh, as a kind of a, just a speaker for these things. And, and it's just middle school girls. And what's incredible, what was incredible, I, I just, I've done a couple of them. I've done one where I showed them how to create a little animated GIF. Um, 
I showed them one how to change memory in a, in a computer and just simple things like this. And they're, they're so afraid of doing something wrong. Yeah. That, um, you know, guys will crash and burn and brush themselves off and they'll do it again. Um, but, but for some reason, the, 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 those middle school girls, they were so worried about, especially with the putting the memory in the computer, they were worried they were going to break it. And, and the first thing I said was, look, I got a pile of old computers over here. We're working with old computers that, that, that people, you know, have, have surplus mess around with them, pull things out. So, you know, uh, then, you know, have fun. Um, and, I, and then, the, then the second thing I said was that, um, you know, all of the tech that, you know, what, yes, these are old machines, but all the things that you're learning here, you can do on any computer. You know, these, 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 these skill, the skill set covers all sorts of computers. And whenever I fired up the first computer after the first, you know, after the first, you know, little team of girls had, had put theirs together, they were thrilled to see that it came up. And then when one didn't come up, I said, okay, let's talk about why it might not have come up. I'm not mad. I'm not worried. Don't worry about it. Let's go ahead and just, and just work our way through this. Um, well, the second thing is, is that, you know, the, the topic of conversation in a classroom full of geeks. Now, understand, I, I always, you know, I'm an electrical engineer. That's my background. And, and the, the, they used to always say, you can't spell geek without double E. And I love that. <laughs> we, you know, we were kind of okay with that. Um, but the topics of conversation in a computer science or an electrical engineering classroom tend to be a little bit, um, well, you know, picture, picture the, the, what is it? The big bang theory, you know, that's, that's the image. And and most, most of the women that I know look at that and say, I love watching that TV show, but I don't want to have anything to do with those people, you know? Um, and I think that it's really nice whenever um, they can start seeing, you know, we do, you can do art with computers um, and not only like graphics, uh, but you can also create dynamic moving sculptures with computers. Um, and when you start giving them projects like that to work on, rather than a project to keep track of your Star Trek database, um, I think that the women tend to tend to be a little bit more encouraged. Yeah, I'd and love to that see that. Bring up. I'm sorry, Erin. No, go ahead, Latisha. That, um, that we bring up the gender issue because we know historically that girls are called on less in math and science classes. Mm -hmm. not encouraged to take risks um, and of course are called upon more in the language arts so by the time they get to college they've been deprogrammed or programmed rather to not take risks in math and science um, as a recruiter I'd go to Georgia Tech for example and talk to the very few young women that are there and they talked about this all the time how even in the college campuses, they're not, they're not encouraged to take risks. If they finish a problem before the men, they're second guessed. So for our listeners, I think it's important for us to really pay attention, um, even, you know, obviously in elementary, all the way up at, at, at the equity. And are we allowing girls to be as engaged? And then we all know the, the stereotypes, right? Good little girls don't break things. <laughs> <laughs> we have a professor saying, go ahead, break it. It's okay. Right. Um, so well, this is very interesting to me. The, you know, the, uh, uh, the, now my brain just kind of went blank, but um, I'll go ahead, Erin, you were going to ask something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, you know, I don't want to go, this is not guy bashing at all. Cause you know, we also need to make sure that we also leave space for the boys to continue to be successful. But, you know, I, so English teacher, I was on, I thought about being a science teacher because science all my life was my thing. My dad encouraged it. My dad was a pilot. In fact, Fred, he wanted me to be an astronaut. Um, <laughs> I wanted to be an astronaut, to be honest. I knew all the stars. I'd gaze them at all at night. Um, but for me, honestly, when the Challenger blew up in front of my eyes, that was, mm. oh, that can happen. Okay, no. 
um, ironically, was a teacher <laughs> <laughs> that, that was in there. So I became a teacher, but I went ELA, not science. And I, I kind of do sit here and wonder, did I doubt myself? Right. Mm-hmm. Was there enough doubt set in me in school? My dad encouraged it. You know, my favorite show as a kid was Nova. Hello. Uh, <laughs> all science. Um, oh. Loved it yes. so much. My dad took me to DC for a weekend so I could go, you know, to the museum and get to see everything. So I lived and breathed it as a child and ask me now if I do anything that has to do with science. Nope. Well, you know, Letitia uh, kind of poked a brain bubble there. Uh, and and what I was what I was remembering was some of my very favorite students, um, one of them, a woman was in one of my uh, microprocessor design classes, senior level class, and everybody is getting ready to you know, start interviewing and so forth. And oftentimes students bring resumes to you and ask for, for critical feedback. And I looked at it and her, her resume, she talked about her experience in, in restaurants and so forth. And I said, I really, these are good because they show that you're you know, a reliable worker, but you're applying for technical jobs. She wasn't even sure she was going to be applying for a technical job. Didn't have that confidence there. And I said, and I know in my class alone, you have learned this skill set, this skill set, this skill set. Oh, but I'm not really entirely sure that, that I know it well enough to put it on my resume. That, that lack of, I, I had, I wouldn't have suggested it to her if I hadn't, it didn't have perfect confidence in her. Um, and so Letitia talking about that, you know, the, the, the women getting called on in class and so forth as much, that may have created that. I don't know. All I know is that um, about five or six years later, that same woman came back for, ma- for her master's degree and told me about all the work she had been done on this particular, at this particular company and so forth. And the excitement in, in her eye and eyes and in her manner made it clear confidence was there now mm-hmm. but that it, what it took to get that confidence up yeah it was kind of a tough I, row go ahead Freddie. i'll pick one I, I find it interesting even at the elementary level um i'm noticing kids are more willing to explore going down a rabbit hole look searching youtube to learn something rather than getting your hands dirty or, or getting your hands on something. This is exploring. I, I have a 10 year old and we were having this conversation. I am exploring, I am doing research. I said, but wouldn't it be more valuable to have something in your hand? I, I've noticed uh, kids, I'm, I'm mm-hmm. K through five, kids are uh, afraid of breaking things and making mistakes a bit more than, than in the past. I don't know where that's coming from, but uh, it's funny we're all bringing this up. I just had a conversation about it with someone a few days ago. Well, wow, you're, you're, yeah, we're, we're, we're edging into an area that's, I think it's kind of tied into, I think for the older kids, primarily social media. I mean, you hear mm. these stories about everybody wants to be perfect on Instagram. You hear about, you know, everyone's got to be perfect. It's the, it's the image that we're putting out there. And I wonder how much that's kind of creeping down into that age. Mm. And then that becomes what they embrace because what everybody's talking about is real. If you look at my classroom makeup out of a class of say 20, three are female, um, and if you look at the program as a whole, you're looking at a small percentage. And I think it goes back to also what, what Dave said. It's if we're not, I forget what the phrase is, but if we're not speaking it into them, if we're not saying, I could see you doing this, or I could see you becoming that, it, it, gets, it gets derailed and we don't see them. Because I, I think you said it before, Letitia, about, I guess there's an age too. It's, it's also an awareness with the young lady. They don't want to raise their hand because they don't want to draw attention to themselves where they're, they're judged. And that's, and that happens at those key ages at, I think, sixth, seventh and eighth grade, when they start to learn algebra or the higher level math, all of a sudden now they want to fade into the woodwork when they should be getting more engaged. It's not really maybe so much at K through four, uh, but it's at that middle school age. And then when they get to high school, it's, it's, it's over. Hmm. Um, And then forget about going on to a college program. And then this is where it gets really deep, right, Dave? the gender bias that we inject into our algorithms that we're creating in our databases and in our software. Nobody, I mean, there's people that are talking about that, but we're now aware of it. When you look at a, so, a male software dominated industry, we're injecting our bias. We're injecting our racial bias into the software. When judges are using 
software to help, uh, you know, do um, terms or um, jail sentences. It's generated by us, the white guy, you know, and um, there's that, that element does, that does exist. So we definitely need to get a much more diverse skills group into tech because I think you said it, nobody wants to get their hands on anything, but we all want to build something digitally, but yet we're not diversifying that field far enough yet. It's not happening fast enough right now. So Fred, what you heard was the nervous laugh when I, when I, when I just laughed, cause you know, we like to be very honest here at TPR race is an issue. I just uh, was listening to an African-American pastor that said that his phone cannot recognize his face. And it's because the people that write the software are white guys. So when he points the, the, the phone to his face, it doesn't recognize him. And then the other point that you made that's interesting because you know teachers need to hear this, but you talked about wait time, even though you didn't say, you didn't use the word or the term wait time. In a math and science classroom, we allow boys to make the mistake and then we stop and allow them to try to self-correct. When a girl makes the mistake, we move on to the next student. Oh, wow. Wow. Are inadvertently teaching girls not to take the risk that Mm. the support is not going to be there. And so they internalize, oh, I'm not even worth the wait. So why even participate? Wow. Even wait time is important. I never thought about that. And now, have you noticed that? For those of you that are like in the classroom, have you noticed the delay with Zoom and questioning? I found myself, I try to be aware of that very thing, but Zoom, Letitia, Zoom for me right now, I, I feel like it's this massive chasm right now. So I'm, I'm more compelled to jump in when right. I don't, I think, I think there's just the tech delay right there yeah. and I'm, and it, and it makes me nervous. It's like, oh boy, nobody knows what's going on now. <laughs> nobody knows where I am. I'm asking the simple question. Like, what's your name? <laughs> there's dead silence. No. Try doing a song. Wait, right. right. So how do, is that? So are you all seeing that, right? Try doing a song on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> try, to, try to assess beat and rhythm to kids on Zoom. Network lag. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now, Pete, you had said something that also made me think, uh, you know, that idea of watching the YouTube videos and so mm. forth. One of the things, and I don't know if I've quite gotten there yet, but you know, there's the idea behind theory versus uh, like uh, technical, you know, being able to be, uh, you know, do I need to understand, do I need to know how to build a watch or is it okay to just know how to tell time? Hmm. Um, and I, I like to think that, that if we're going to keep up with technology, it's really kind of good to know at least how the inner workings of the watch work. Um, and whenever we're watching, I mean, there are all sorts of great, great resources on the web um, that show step-by-step procedures on, in terms of taking a Raspberry Pi and getting, to, getting it to make a, a, a robot or something like that. Sure. And if a student follows those steps, what it, it's, it's no better than cut and paste. Uh, you know, that idea of I, I, copy, I copy what they're doing, I got the exact results. I'm just duplicating their results. But can they create something new? And that's the thing I'm worried about is that the students aren't able to create something new by not digging, not, by not understanding the fundamental theory. Mm. And, you know, this kind of goes back to what you all were talking about with the, the wait time, I think is what you called it, Letitia. Yes. Um, that wait time is them digging down. It's mm-hmm. them them trying to get the theory right rather than just simply copying and pasting. Um, I'm going to tell a story on my wife without her permission. So she can't watch this video. Um, Whenever we were, whenever she was in in high school, um, she was in advanced placement math all the way through until she got to her geometry class. And I, Aaron, I may have told you this story before. I'm not sure. Um, and the teacher told Karen, you know, what are you doing in this class? You have no business being in this class. Now it was actually a female teacher, which is what knocks my socks off. Um, and it was like, you flipped a switch in Karen and her math grades suddenly went from all A's to she's struggling to get by. 
And when I met her, we met in college. Um, she was in a calculus. She had just finished a calculus class not long after we had met, or not long before we met. And she and and she said, "I just don't get the you know derivatives. I don't get integrals. I don't get all that sort of stuff." And when I kind of explained to her exactly what she was doing, she she goes, "Really? Is that all it is?" Mm-hmm. And and what she was doing to make it through the test was she was memorizing all of the examples in the textbook, memorizing all the examples in the homework, memorizing all the examples that he'd were that the teacher had worked on the board and prayed that there was something she could substitute numbers for in the, on the test. Mm. That's not somebody, that's somebody that's doing cut and paste. Yeah. Um, and, and then they're, they're, they're not digging down. So yeah, it's, that's, I, I, I didn't realize this was going to get so deep, but yeah. That's a t- that is such a hard balance, but you're also talking about a hard balance. I, I had a great conversation. So it's the same thing. So if everybody's not quite around, what we're talking about is, remember the slide rule? Some of us had it in school, some of us didn't, but there was a slide rule, which was before the calculator. Somebody made a conscious decision in education that said, we are no longer going to use the slide rule. We're going to start using the calculator. And now we're moving away from the calculator, right? We're moving to smart devices. So we're, we're kind of going that direction. And I kind of wonder, like, what's really the necessary, what, what, where does the balance, where's the break from? So like cars today, growing up, I would change my oil. I could change my uh, generator. I could change my starter. I could change the plugs. Today, I don't even know where it is. All I know is I put, I get in the car, press the button. It takes me from point A to point B. And I think it goes back to what is the goal? You know, but I think there's something else though, what you said though, and that's the ability to break problems down and critically analyze them and understand what's the best solution to go forward. And then if that's a copy and paste, then go. If it's build the next great whatever, then do that. And that's where I think that's where people struggle with where, where does the education system belong in all that? And what are we really trying to teach people? I wish that's where the focus may be better placed is what is the goal? Are we trying to just get people to understand how to flip a burger after 12 years or do we want them to be great thinkers? I don't know. And that's where this whole conversation we're hearing now internationally, especially nationally about learning loss. And my, what I question without a doubt, there's, there's been some learning loss in reading and math for sure. Math overwhelmingly, but perhaps this is something that maybe we needed to have happen to think about, other things, other skills that, that we need to make sure that we're honing in on with our students. And we've kind of talked about this a little bit, um, but I don't know. I sometimes get a little frustrated because I think you're right, Fred, like how much of it is our learning supposed to be? You just memorize these things and then regurgitate them, or you can learn these things, but also then I want to give you tons of time to then play with it, take risks, make discoveries, explore, learn what's wrong, you know, if you apply this or learn how you can make it even better. I'd much rather spend more time doing that in the classroom and and having kids learn that. And I guess that goes back to, again, all the stuff that's standardized and the tests and everything. But I just feel like we need to give our students more time to think, more time to play and take risks. Um, And then also it's not really fair, but as educators, there's so much on our shoulders because you never know what you might say or not intentionally do um, that could really, um, you know, change the way someone uh, has self-confidence in themselves anymore. Like Dave was talking about with Karen, right? right? Yeah, but it, so I know that there's some very smart people in education, <laughs> much smarter than me. And I'm sure there's people leading us into a direction, right? At the national level, all that Pete. Right, right. Thanks. <laughs> He's like, miss a miss. <laughs> um, I've got a few on both sides. <laughs> but I, I, I kind of wonder if there, if the conversation is disjointed. Like here we are in education. We do this in higher education a lot. We make changes to our curriculum, and then we'll say, "Oh, because we think this is the way the industry is going," or we think when we really sometimes don't have really focused, dedicated understanding. Like, what should the outcome be? Like, where are these people going to really be going? And even with, so K through 12, are, are there conversations being had 
with industry sectors. I know that there's partnerships and there's good things in here and there, but it doesn't feel like it's a strategic initiative. It feels like it's patchwork because everything you just said, Aaron, reminds me of that all happens, but it only happens at the special summer camp for the kids who can afford it. Or it only happens at the, you know, the other event at the month away up in, you know, out of in another state. It's not happening enough across the even platform. And if we're going to thrive as an, a, a, comp, or a country, we have to be able to cast our nets far wider. Because right now we're still dealing with this philosophy of, well, we know there's always going to be that 10% and the 10% are always going to excel. We're not, you can't be sustainable if you think you're only going to harvest 10% of anything. And, and that's where, that's why I do my thing with get me coding. And that's, I know where Dave's passion is with everything that he's doing. And I know you're all passionate about education, but the, the nets must be widened so we can build up a better society, not just toss out the people that just can't cut it just because we think that they can't make it because we think this is what they need. We have to be having a better conversation. That's interesting stuff. Well, it's fascinating. I wish I was smart enough to figure it all out though. <laughs> I think Thanks, you're well on yeah, your you don't have to figure the whole thing out at one time. Just do one little bit at a time. What is the, what mm. is the saying? How, you know, how do you eat, eat an elephant? You know, one bite at a one time. I'm sorry, and Leticia. Think, you know, it's, it's kind of like a catch 22, right? Because on one end, we complain that our college our graduating classes are not critical thinkers. I mean, employers are saying this all the time, right? Bill Gates gets involved with education and all these folks because the workforce is showing that we are not producing critical thinkers. So we know this, but then we make everything teach to the test. And so you can't have both ways, right? You can't, but yeah, of course right. we know that money's tied to the test. And so at the end of the day, money becomes more important than us producing citizens that critically think. And that's the solution. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Pete, I'm curious about your students. What kind of risk taking do you see? Or is it is it really trying to stick to the notes? And if you if you make a bad note, is there a lot of frustration and angst? Like, tell us a little bit. So they, they know that Mr. Bush has a saying, and I, I put it out there from kindergarten on. Um, I have gifts here in the office from kids that got it engraved for me as gifts like later on. But it's if you make them uh if you play a note wrong once, it's a mistake. If you do it twice, we call that jazz. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's and that's our philosophy with everything. Um, and I, I know Patsy's that way, our guest from last week, and a lot of the teachers I know. Um, that's my, there are no mistakes, period, you know, uh, for me whatsoever. I, I, I get weak in the knees when I hear music music, because that doesn't happen in my world very often. Um, <laughs> I just want to get the kids. To, I'm, I'm not about the music. I'm about the, the exploration and the discovery and the learning and starting to put, you know, those, those uh, railroad tracks in the ground that will lead these kids to people like our friends here tonight. Um, that's, that's what I want to do. It's not about the music really. If I could ask you, I, I know you, you got some questions that were sent to you, Dave. Could I ask you what your favorite toy was growing up? Oh, good one. Good one. <laughs> Now that you, you know, I can't answer, I, you know, I can't answer with just one sentence. Um, <laughs> I, I am a car guy. I am a hundred percent a car guy. And um, so I, I don't identify with the, you know, we've talked about you and I have talked about D and D and things like that. I never identified with any of that stuff. Um, and so my very first, I had a, it was a 1963 galaxy little metal model uh, not model, but like a toy car. That was 100% my favorite car, uh, toy. I just love cars. And I, uh, as you can tell, you know, uh, I, I hate to admit this publicly, but we have seven cars and, and, um, and it's just because I can't seem to get rid of any of them. <laughs> <laughs> so my toys, my toys stayed the same. They just got bigger. bigger. You know, and the only reason why I was asking that was because I think the, you know, if, if, if there's a role to play for a parent, that would be also to foster that, that curiosity and that exploration. And that could happen through toys. And I, I think yeah. about a lot of the toys, you know, the toys I have behind me here, yeah. they were all part of that. My mom was that person. I've said this before. It's, in, you know, I've, I've talked about it before, but my mom was that person that put that toy in front of me. I might not have played with it at that point. It might've went in the closet, 
But six months later, all of a sudden I'm fascinated by it and I'm playing with it. All, I'm building with it. I'm touring apart. And, and I think that that's the other thing too, is like, even though we're talking about the, maybe the, some of the weaknesses of the education system, there's also the, the parenting system too, that's, or, or the guardians or, or the family that's even friends that can do that. And that's why I asked you about the toys. I knew you were going well, with the car. It was, I, I just wanted to hear you what you were going to say. Well, um, I did a, I did a little, and I, I did a little experiment a couple of years ago in one of my classes where um, just as a part of getting to know you kind of thing. And I didn't have them do this publicly. I had them do this on a little three by five card. Um, you know, tell, tell me an interest that you have that would, you know, that, that I wouldn't know, just, you know, something other you know, non-computing. Now, of course you have the guys in there that are gamers and they're going to all say, you know, I love playing with my, you know, the Xbox or the PS4 or whatever it is, but that was only about half of them. The other half, I was, I was blown away by some of their responses. There were some that were, you know, there was one that was, uh, she was really into cosplay, um, another one, there were a bunch of them that were into music, making their own musical instruments, um, you know, and, and some of the some of their interests were just fascinating. But by doing that up front, I was able to actually start saying, OK, let's talk about, um, you know, how would we make it so that the cosplay, how could we light it up? How could we get yeah. that, that that thing to light up in this particular instrument, you know? Let's talk about the, the humbucker pickups on a guitar and we'll talk about exactly how they're picking things up. And by understanding those, you know, their interests and how diverse they are, how incredibly diverse they are, um, you, you know, there's, there's always a computer application you can always That's come cool. up with. But um, yeah, the, the, the thing that I'm so happy about with getting content online is I'm going to do that, you know, we've heard about flipping the classroom, right? Um, I don't want to flip the classroom if they have to read um, before coming to class. What I wanted, but, but if I can lecture to them before coming to class, have that be the, you know, face-to-face -face in video. I've also got that podcast, however they want to absorb the material. Now we can come in, we can start playing with this stuff. Mm -hmm. I never That's had time to, to I never had time to play with anything in class. We never had time because the next class, you know, that, that sequence of classes, that next course needs them to know all of these prerequisites right. before they go into that one. And if yeah. I miss any, and if we have a snow day or something like that, I'm right walking this tightrope. But now I've got an opportunity to flip the class, something I've never been able to do before. And I'm pretty excited about that come fall. That's cool. Nice. Well, I wish we could keep talking, but I don't want to take up too much more of your time, Dave. You probably have more videos that you're going to create. <laughs> so as I'm, you know, I'm going to take a suggestion from Letitia. What, what do you want? <laughs> Email me, Letitia. What's the next topic you want to hear? About? <laughs> That'd be great. That'd be great. He's always so Letitia real quick. He does some and everyone else out there speaking of just passion stuff and, and finding ways to incorporate uh, your knowledge into to other things. Dave also does some fun videos. Do you want to talk about the baby real quick before? Oh, oh, yeah. Um, back in the, what was it, the 1940s, uh, there was a computer called the Manchester Baby. Is this the one you're talking about? Yeah. And um, it's, you know, being the very first stored program computer. Guess what? It was simple. Um, there were only seven instructions that you could do. There was, you know, one memory, there was you know, yeah. a couple of memory locations. And so, yeah, I was able to, um, kind of just say, look, this computing stuff is not that hard. Uh, in fact, um, in fact, Charles Babbage in the 1800s, the, the analytical engine, it has all of the components that a modern computer has. The only difference is, is that we've just, you know, added these new tweaks and these new tweaks and these new tweaks in order to make them faster and faster and faster. Um, what is it? Lady Ada Lovelace. Um, she wrote a paper about Charles Babbage's machine and she was talking about being able to create music and images with it. She was talking about multimedia before the first computer was even invented. Um, so all of these tech, all of the, all, you know, anytime you can just go back and, and find some cool old technology, it may be old, but it's still very applicable today. 
That's so true. All right. So we're going to go around and we're going to give a couple of takeaways here. And then Dave, we'll, we'll hand it off to you to finish with some final words. So um, Fred, you want to go first? Sure. I, I, I've really enjoyed hearing you speak tonight, uh, David. I know I always love talking to you because I think you're, you're right on the front of where you need to be right now. You're right in the right spot at the right time. Um, and we, and there's so much more to do. So I, I don't think there was anything particular except for the, the, e, the EE and geek, which I love. I've heard you say that before. That's, that's right on there. Even though I'm com sci and the geek, which doesn't fit, but it's, uh, it's something totally different. But I guess the thing that I, I'm, I'm, I think I hope people can hear um, is your, your, the way you addressed the price of over the, the way textbooks are overpriced. You've taken content and you've been able to consolidate it in a very useful, meaningful way. It still achieves your goals and your objectives in your course. And you've taken a burden off the student that they don't have to worry about. That is such an important message. I hope other teachers, especially at the higher ed level, can take and figure out how to do. Um, and even if it means looking for grants, seeking out the leadership from the administration um, to, to make that happen, because it can happen, right? It doesn't have to be a you know, a juggernaut textbook, but that's what I would take away is the battle with the textbooks and you won. So that's cool. Thanks. Nice. Fred. Letitia. Well, like uh, Fred, I, I don't have a quote, I guess, or, or a very specific uh, takeaway, but this is what I did gather and, and why Dave really encouraged me tonight is because I'm starting to see a pattern with our guests that have been in education for a long time and still have that passion, that energy, that love for their students. And I think the common thread that I see is the pivoting, uh, the ability to pivot, to reinvent your teaching, to almost rebrand yourself kind of keeps that fire going and alive. Um, and so to see after all of these years, your excitement, your passion and compassion um, was really uh, refreshing and welcome tonight. So thank you so much, sir, for your work. Thank you. Pete. So Dave further solidified a message we've heard from so many of our past guests about how um, I think he said, don't be afraid to burn the ships. We hear that a lot, just like Letitia said as well, um, the pivoting, you know be brave. Don't be afraid to take those chances. And also the best teachers make welcoming connections, um, how you help dense subjects become more uh, accessible and to teach with humor. These are things we've heard almost in every single one of our episodes. And here's proof again tonight. Uh, the last thing was um, how, uh, you know, when you're not feeling good, you're feeling crappy, uh, you're feeling sick, that natural medicine that you can get from being with your kids when you're feeling run down. I've taught with kidney stones. Um, when you're sure. able to get some of that adrenaline from being with the kids, it's for me, it's like being on stage um, and you feel a little bit better afterwards. I haven't thought about that in a long time, but a hundred percent correct that it's, it's like this booster shot um, when you get to work with the, with, for me, with the kids um, and very, very helpful. So thank you, sir. So good to see you. Thanks, Pete. Good to see you. I keep having the word confidence going through my mind. Uh, this idea that not just to build, make sure we're building confidence in our students, no matter what age they are, but also that we need groups like this to build confidence in each other. Just because we're adults doesn't mean that we don't get, uh, con you know, self-conscious, right? And so I'm thinking that we not only build confidence in our students, but we also do that with each other, with our colleagues. I think it's important. So. Um, you know, make sure to do that because we all need it. You never know how you might be helping out a friend there uh, for the day. And how about you, Dave? Any last nuggets of wisdom you want to leave us or any kind of takeaway you got today from I the appreciate everything. There's some, been some wonderful things you all have shared tonight. Um, learned a lot. You know, uh, the, I had a friend uh, who I taught with who, when he taught database, he did. He made, uh, he made a Star Trek database. I didn't have any idea. I used to pick on him because I'd say things like, now, Harrison Ford, uh, he, he, he was, he was the, he, he led the enterprise, right? Oh, Don would get so mad at me. But my databases weren't any less biased because uh, I was doing cars. Um, and so I, you know, you know, over the years, I've learned to slowly try to do, to relieve that bias, but that, that job is never done. 
Oh, it's not hard. done. And uh, so I really appreciate being uh, being asked to, to come out here and spend time with you lovely people. I, um, um, I really me meant it whenever I said that uh, I missed my support group. Uh, I think that's, I miss my students, but second, I miss my, my uh, other teachers that I hang around the, the lunch table with and just chat about what's going on in classes and, and what we're doing to help, you know, to, to help get better. And you all have helped me tonight. So thank you. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Dave, where can our listeners find you if they want to see some of these great videos or listen to some of your podcasts? <laughs> um, I, uh, the, the, the podcast and everything can be found at intermation.com. That's uh, I-N-T-E-R, like internet, intermation.com. Um, and if you just search on Intermation on YouTube, you'll find my channel. Um, it's uh, what youtube.com slash C slash Intermation, I think is, is the URL. Um, the, the podcast and everything, um, you know, I, I think I would like to pick that back up again. I know that during the pandemic and focusing on the videos so much, we've kind of lost a little bit of time with the podcast, but um, that's kind of where you'd find me. Thank you. And Pete, how about our TPR people out there? Oh my gosh. Tonight <laughs> is our 25th episode. What? I'm on. And, and we planned, we planned David to be on tonight. We have a lovely prize package on the way. <laughs> but tonight is our 25th most excellent episode. That means so we got 24 past episodes for everybody to enjoy out there. And they're all awesome. So give us a subscribe, leave a review, share some feedback. Um, connect with us, Facebook, YouTube, and at our website, uh, teacherpeprally.com. We'd love to hear from you, but um, 25 episodes. So there we go. I'm so <laughs> proud of my baby. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Dave, thank you so much for being here. I think when I get off uh, Zoom, I'm going to go get a piece of raspberry pie, not the computer <laughs> piece, but the dessert. Thank you for mentioning that my sweet tooth has been tickled all night. <laughs> I figured me too. A little whipped cream. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate you, bud. So you can't you. do that with an Arduino. <laughs> <laughs>